Enjoy the session. Welcome back for the second of the proteins track. I'm Mark Ross. I'm the chair of this session and um, co-chairing with Franca Fratinelli. Um, she'll be covering the two sessions that we have tomorrow. So we've got two highlight talks, um, one about something called AlphaFold that probably we've never really heard of before, um, and one proceedings talk. So let's make a start. And first of all, we've got Preeti Chowdhury from the EBI, and she's talking about PDB-KB collaboratively, collaboratively defining the biological context of structural data. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, and welcome for my talk. I'll be talking about our resource PDBE knowledge base today. Uh, so I'm working at PDBE, uh, Protein Data Bank in Europe. We are located just outside Cambridge in United Kingdom. And together with uh, PDB RC, RCSB PDB, BMRB, uh, BMM, BMRB in America and uh, PDBJ in Japan, we are the core members of Worldwide Protein Data Bank. And we, together we collect curate, store, and distribute the experimentally determined 3D structures for biological macromolecules. Now, talking about uh, 3D structures, these are nothing but coordinates, and uh, they, they tell us uh, the, the, the positions of atomic atoms of biomolecule, and in itself, they just specify the shape. They are not necessarily of any biological value. So it's important to know what kind of um, you know, small molecule is binding to it to add a scientific meaning to it and also to, ha to look at various other properties like you know, what are the macromolecular interactions, what are uh, known variants and mutations known for that particular protein. Now, some of this metadata we already add uh, during deposition process and it helps us to link even more data after our release. Uh, but, uh, and it also gives more biological and chemical meaning to the structures in the PDB. Uh, talking about giving more context, that's where we established uh, PDBE KB. This is essentially a protein data bank in Europe knowledge base a community-driven resource to, annotate, to basically bring all the structural and functional annotation under one umbrella to promote basic and applied research. Now, we as a core member, we create various data standards and data access mechanisms uh, via which you know, the community can share this data or value-added annotations. Meanwhile, this helps us to reduce fragmentation of the data, and we sort of strive towards creating one stop shop for the users. And it benefits both the, the community, uh, the developer of the database, and the users. So uh, talking about fragmentation of data, now in PDB, uh, the protein structures are not unique. There are many, many proteins which have different types, different structures solved with vari under various experimental conditions, bound to various molecules, and even macromolecules. Now, there are many specialist databases which annotate different kinds of properties, you know, biophysical properties, biochemical properties, and they all are scattered together. Under PDBEKB, what we try to do is bring all data from all these specialist databases and interconnect them and annotate via the protein sequence. And the kind of data which we integrate varies from domain annotation, uh, ligand binding sites, covalent binders, drug binding molecules, sequence conservation, flexibility, res residue accessibility, depth, and so on. So to give you an overview of PDB KB infrastructure, the project started or the community was established in 2018. 
Since then, we have now, today, uh, 29 consortium members, and all these members, they basically uh, share the data with us in a defined uh, JSON file format. And um, we have a weekly process which is running for uh, every week for uh, validating and in uh, integrating this data uh, into our in-house database, graph database. This database has uh, over 1.2 billion uh, residue level annotations. This database can be downloaded by users for local access. We use this database to, uh, to expose uh, various data uh, via API endpoints. This API endpoint is also used by our aggregated views. These are essentially the web pages, uh, which I'll talk about in more details. When I say aggregated view in PDB EKB, you know, we, uh, these are a set of novel web pages where we focus and aggregate data with respect to a specific target. Now, we can aggregate the data in various uh, possible ways. Uh, and for example, you know, you can, as, like I mentioned before, you know, this, uh, the data is not unique in PDB. For example, if you look at the protein Aurora kinase, it has 166 structures, which is bound to 150 different small molecules. Now, traditionally, if you go to PDB entry pages, you would find that uh, the data is uh, scattered all across of PDB specific pages. So you will have to go by, scroll over 166 structures. Now with PDB KB creating such page, pages, uh, what we have done is we have collated all these structures based on protein sequence and uh, we created a page specific for a given protein by uh, an organism which is keyed by its uniprot accession. Now, this is how aggregated view of protein looks like. Uh, we have a representative structure for various segments of the protein. You have data for, you know, showing the structure, all the structures which are present for that protein, various ligand bounds, various interactions it's having, um, you know, with macromolecules. We also show various annotations from our, or our partners, we show similar proteins and publications for this particular protein. Now, throughout this uh, pages, we have used uh, interactive visualization. For instance, we have a 2D sequence viewer called ProtVista, which you'll see in uh, subsequent sli slides. It's a very handy uh, visualization, which uh, you know you have protein sequence on uh, horizontally, and uh, you can easily see patterns. Uh, in the data in such view. You can also see them in 3D in our uh, 3D viewer Molstar. And we have you know, various kinds of data like superimposition and other things which I'll discuss in subsequent slides. Now, before moving to data, let's talk about the big milestones of this uh, you know, resource. The PDBKB, as uh, it started in 2018, and since then, it has you know, uh, over one million unique users. And the last update uh, was done uh, last year uh, towards the end, where we released Protein Pages version six. Very recently, we had added uh, annotations for predicted complexes from Model Archive, which is a very high quality uh, complexes uh, data set from Baker's lab. And uh, I will talk about all these milestones and the kind of data we have in my subsequent slides. So let's see. So first, uh, you know, uh, Uniprot has more than uh, two, 227 million protein sequences, but PDB only has 191,000 protein structures, out of which only 59,000 are unique proteins. So only 0.27% of protein sequence is experimentally determined. Now with with structure prediction methods like alpha fold, we have now highly accurated structures. So it made sense to expand the sequence space coverage. And for this, we established a, a resource or a community, 3D Beacons. And it was a collaboration between PDB and various uh, protein structure data resources, like alpha fold protein structures, Swiss model, genome 3D. And this network basically provides a uniform access to both experimentally determined as well as predicted protein structures. Uh, 
So because of this, now we have predicted models on our aggregated view of proteins, which you can see shown over here in gray, uh, gray, uh, re gray region. And the experimental ones are shown in blue. Uh, let's talk about now superposition. Uh, we do superposition uh, for all the structures of an individual protein in the whole PDB archive. For this, we are using Gazam software to structurally align the PDB chains mapped to uniprot segments of a given protein. Now, these aligned PDB chains are then clustered based on structural similarity. For example, uh, here you can see the example of uh, replicase polyprotein uh, from SARS-CoV-2. And you can see that uh, this segment, uh, which corresponds to NSP13 region, is clustered into four different uh, you know, conformations for more than over 120 chains. Now, one thing to note over here is that these conformations uh, at this point are purely computational based, and they only show the fluctuations in the structure. They may not uh, necessarily uh, correspond to biological functions. Now, this is something which we are really actively working on, making superposition more, uh, the clustering really more efficient so that we can, you know, have, uh, have clusters which have more biological meaning. We also uh, do superposition, we also show a ligand view for, uh, for the superposed chain. Now, this is very handy when you want to see a quick glance of all the ligand binding proteins on your, on your, on, on your protein. For example, this is a very busy example, uh, you know, but you can see there is a huge blob in the center where all uh, of the molecules are binding. That's the active site for this enzyme. And then on the periphery, you see a lot of, uh, you know, saccharides binding as well. Uh, now, before I go into more details about other data annotations, I would like to highlight how, you know, these pages can be used to answer specific uh, scientific question. For example, here I show you adenyl kinase from E. coli K12. This particular enzyme catalyzes the transfer of phosphate. So it basically, you know, breaks ATP into AMP, releasing two ADP molecules. If you go to the aggregated pew, uh, pages of this particular protein, uh, you will see that uh, there are three different types of uh, uh, small molecules which have same scaffold. AMP and ANP, uh, A AMP adenosine monophosphate, you have ANP, which is an analog of ATP. Then you have AP5, which is, you know, having four phosphates and two adenosine moieties. Now, if you look at the ligand binding sites, you can see that AMP and ANP, they have distinct binding sites. And the ligand, which is, you know, combined of the two of them has a uh, mixed binding site or the overlapping binding site. Uh, so even without looking at the structure, just from the 2D view, you can see over here the patterns in the binding site. And that's where the, you know, the 2D viewer Prot Vista comes in handy. Also in the, uh, on the image you over here, this is from the superposition. You can see the, the two uh, conformational states. The orange closed one is actually the one which is binding to AP5. Uh, cases or where both AMP and a a a a ANP are combined, bind. So you need the complete ligand to have the, con the, the closed conformation, which is very clear from the uh, superposition view. Now, moving on, let's talk about other, other data types. We have improved our way of, uh, you know, data for polyproteins. We now show, show all the processed proteins to which it is cleaved. And to each of these, uh, these uh, processed proteins, you have individual page, which is keyed by a, a Uniprot Pro ID. And if you link on the, uh, on the green box, you can, you can see the molecule in 3D as well. We have also ligand annotations, and now we show, you know, uh, what ligands are reactant-like, drug-like, or cofactor-like. And you can see that information in our ligand gallery and in our uh, sequence feature view, ProtVista. You also, we also have a, a weekly process to identify antibodies, and we now show that in macromolecular annotation structure, and it is highlighted in green. 
Uh, okay. So we also have, you know, many more annotations from various resources uh, like NotProt giving us topology annotations, FireProt DV uh, showing the effects of variants, and Scampi, uh, Scampi as well showing the effects of variants, flexibility predictions via WebNMA, and uh, Metal PDB uh, showing the biological role of metals. We, we also uh, recently uh, made bulk download service, so it is very easy now uh, to download the data, whatever you see on the pages. Uh, by the click of single button, uh, you know, you can download coordinate files, validation reports, sequences of the protein of interest. Uh, apart from the aggregated view of proteins, we have the stand standalone uh, bulk download service where you can just put in the list of all your proteins and get the data out. Uh, apart from you know developing uh, de uh, developing the aggregated views web pages, we while we are developing them, we make sure that uh, you know we are also trying to develop tools which are reusable, and community can contribute to it as well. So all of the web components uh, used on these pages for data visualization, uh, they are open source. For example. Uh, the RNA topology viewer is open source. The entire uh, web components used in 3D beacons uh, is also open source on GitHub. We also have uh, you know, API endpoints, more than 90 uh, now, and there is the publication linked over there uh, to give you the details, uh, to access all the data programmatically. And you can visit these videos and tutorials to, to, as a guide how to use them. Additional information, uh, for additional information, you can go to our training website for tutorials and on YouTube channel for webinars. Uh, just to uh, remind you that uh, the graph database through which uh, we have the entire data is download downloadable in this particular link. And all the components which you see from ProtVista and everything else is also available openly on GitHub. And uh, there's lots of exciting things happening in this project. Just to name a few, uh, you know, we are working actively improving superposition of proteins. We are also looking how to superimpose binding pockets and assemblies. We are actively working on incorporating the prose translational data and cross-linking the data uh, from Pride. And we are also improving our PISA software for characterizing of macromolecular interfaces. So keep an eye out on our news page for the latest updates. And then I would like to acknowledge all the team members and all the uh, you know, consortium members of PDB, KB, and the funding agencies for making this resource happen. And any questions? Thank you. Okay, if you have a question, get to the microphone. Hello, uh, really nice talk. And thank you so much for the work all of you do on uh, PDBE. Uh, so I had a question about the uh, superposition of structures of chains. Uh, uh, last time I looked at it, I could download uh, the transformation matrices that were used and applied on each one of the chains to then generate the uh, transform coordinates but I was not able to download the transform coordinates already, you know, like the PDBs, the PDB files of the transformation, the transform coordinates. So is this something that is now implemented with this bulk download, something on the works? Yeah, yeah. those so super, uh, super imposition matrices are available on our FTP site, and also Molstar is supporting, so you can, you can, you know, straight away download the superpose coordinates from Molstar viewer. So which is a recent feature which we have. Okay, so this is with a bulk download. Uh, so this is for uh, the aggregated view, uh, for a single protein you see on the web page, the superposition mm -hmm. view. So you can download all the coordinates which you see in the 3D viewer over there. So that is an individual? Protein, yes. Because the superposition is happening for a given protein. Mm -hmm. yes. Is it one uh, PDB file per chain? It's for a given segment because we are we are uh, superimposing a segment of a protein depending upon you know 
how the 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 co sequence coverage, the structural coverage of the sequence. Yeah, I mean, for, for the given uh, segment, is it one file containing yes. all of the chains? Yes, yes. Okay, so what I would be asking is one file per chain. Yes, per okay. cluster in this case. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's get one more quick question in. Um, quick question on your mentioning that you are weekly identifying the antibody chain. So if you could elaborate how it's done and whether it's a PDBE KB specific update or are you going to feed them back to like the classical PDB pages? I am afraid I will not be able to answer that question because I am not aware about that pipeline, but I can get back to you on the details how it's done. I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, great. Let's thank Preeti once more. Thank you. Now for our second talk in the session. So we've got Michael Tress from the Spanish National Cancer Research Center, and he's going to talk to us about APRIS and uh, principal protein isoforms. Okay, um, thank you very much to the organizers for, for inviting me. Um, yeah, this is a paper that's just been published in, in Bioinformatics Today, I think along with uh, probably a lot of, or maybe even all of the proceedings talks. And it's a bit difficult to get the Bioinformatics webpage at the moment, and that may be due to us. Okay, so. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is, is um, uh, trying to, how to um, determine what is the reference isoform form for, uh, for a coding gene. Or the reference transcript. And here what you can see is a, a whole range of uh, different um, splice isoforms um, for the gene to fax in. Um, these are predicted by AlphaFold, they're available on the EBI um, database, and I've just downloaded them, stuck them all on a slide, and so you can see there's a whole completely uh, bunch of different structures there. And um, given that, how would you actually know which one of these is the most important of the isoforms? Um, so if you're in, only interested in, in choosing a single representative transcript for a gene, um, how would you actually go about choosing it? And in fact, this is not um, a, a minor question because actually for an awful lot of studies, you are only interested in one representative transcript. So um, for a long time, um, uh, what's been available um, are you can either choose that what's the longest uh, available CDS um, which captures as many features as possible, and this is the case in, in many uh, Uniprot, um, Swissprot uh, display isoforms. Um, you can use transcription evidence, um, choose a dominant transcript uh, using um, some sort of method of transcript convolution, or you can use the uh, APRIS principle isoforms which we developed and that are based on cross-species conservation and the preservation of structure, protein structure and function in the isoforms. However, um, a new paper came out this year, um, which is a collaboration between uh, RefSec and um, Ensemble, where they got together to choose a single main transcript, a single most important transcript for um, the human gene set, uh, for every clinical, for every protein coding gene. And these transcripts were chosen by two automatic pipelines, they had one each. And these two pipelines were slightly different, but in both cases, they were based on conservation, um, transcript expression, clinical information, and, and, and to a certain extent in the length of the protein as well. So um, what they found was that, uh, they, that they differed from what might be considered the most used transcript. So this is a figure that comes from their paper. In blue, you can see where the main transcript agrees with the longest transcript or the uh, most expressed transcript. Um, in, um, in yellow, you can see the regions where the main doesn't agree with either of them, and then the two where it agrees with one or the other is in gray or, or, or orange. And, um, so that the one that it agrees with most is the longest transcript, and it's uh, uh, approximately 81% uh, of the time that it agrees with the longest transcript. And if you make the comparison between main and APRIS, the agreement is 94%. Well, given that, which of these four methods is the best at choosing um, reference transcripts? Which transcript, is another way of saying it, produces the most important um, cellular protein isoform? Um, so what we've done is we've, 
we've um, taken the four different means of, of, of selecting the protein isoform, um, or the, the selecting the reference transcript, and we've evaluated it in two different ways. Um, first of all, we took the, um, the representative transcript from uh, GenCode 37 for each of these cases, where we could, and first of all, we try and uh, um, see um, which method best coincides with the protein evidence, and then maybe one of the methods has a poor agreement with the protein evidence, and maybe you know, we, uh, we can more or less ignore that method. And then we can check to see whether the reference transcripts are, are actually going um, purifying selection using human genetic variation. And again, you can see maybe see methods where the reference exons are not under purifying selection. And then hopefully we'll end up with the most important transcript. Okay, so first of all, which reference transcripts best coincide with the proteomics evidence? Here what we did is we took um, spectra from five live, five large-scale uh, proteomics analysis. Um, they covered 52 tissues in total. So here what we're doing is we're um, counting up the peptide spectrum matches that map to each of the different isoforms. Um, and we end up choosing the isoform um, in each gene that has the most uh, peptide spectrum matches that maps. So here's an example, for example, this is BKOR-C1L1, uh, um, and the longest transcript, which is the third transcript in the alignment, has more uh, PSM than any other, um, than any other, any other isoform, and, and in partly because it's the longest, because it's got a, an internal extension and there's a peptide with 87 different um, PSM that supports it. And so that would, be, that would count for this gene as the main proteomics isoform. And what we find is that the agreement with the main proteomics isoform, um, and here you can see for the, for the four different methods along with uh, random selection, which of the methods um, best agrees. And, and, and really there's two methods that agree better than the other. Um, there's a high agreement between APRI's um, principal isoforms and the main um, prote proteomics isoform. It's 95.5%, and main select is, is um, very, very similar with 94.6% agreement with the main um, proteomics isoform. Um, what is maybe most interesting is that you, if you just look at those genes that have um, both where, where the main select and APRI's principal uh, transcripts agree, then um, they, they agree with the proteomics isoform over 98.2% uh, of the time. And it turns out that transcript expression, choosing a, um, a transcript based on, 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 uh, on RNA, R, RNA seq counts is not a good prediction of protein level expression. Um, and, and this is uh, largely because um, when you use RNA seq measures to choose a, a, a dominant transcript, it tends to choose a shorter transcript, and it tends to leave out a, an important part of the protein. You can see the gene uh, RAB7A there uh, in blue. Um, there's a, the, the region that's painted in red is left out of the dominant RNA-C transcript, and it's really important for the binding of the ligand. So it's, um, this is, this is a, a, a tendency um, of our using RNA-Seq to choose the, the dominant transcript. So secondly, um, if we use um, human genetic variant data um, from the, uh, from the um, uh, Thousand Genomes Project, um, then we want to actually try and find out whether exons from reference transcripts are undergoing uh, purifying selection or not. So if you um, just look at those genes where the main select principal isoform and longest transcript agree, on which is the reference isoform, it's what we're seeing here in blue, then um, you calculate non-synonymous um, to synonymous ratios for uh, exons that belong to these reference transcripts and also to exons that belong to alternative transcripts. Um, what you find is that on the left-hand side, you can see that the non-synonymous rate to synonymous ratios um, for the rare variants, which is the dark blue, are much higher than they are for the um, for the common variants, um, significantly higher as well. And this difference shows that the exons are under purifying selection. If you look at the alternative um, exons in this case, then 
um, what you'll find, what you can see is that there's no difference in the non-synonymous non to synonymous ratios, which basically means uh, these exons are um, not under um, purifying selection. They're basically evolving neutrally. Um, so that shows that in these particular cases, you've got a um, um, set of uh, exons which are, uh, are really functionally important, and the alternative exons where there's very little evidence of functional importance. So then the question is, um, what happens if we look at um, those exons that are unique to the three methods, APRIS, principal isoforms, main, select, and the longest CDS? Um, so in the case of APRIS and main, um, you can see the same pattern, more or less. You can see that for the um, for this, uh, reference exons, they're under, um, they're under purifying selection. And you can see, uh, again, next to them on the right-hand side, the alternative exons are not under purifying selection. They're, they're evolving neutrally again. So which, that shows that main select transcripts and APRI's principal transcripts are, uh, have functional importance. Um, meanwhile, if you actually look at the uh, exons that belong solely to the longest CDS, so these are ones that don't overlap with the APRI's principal isoforms in this case, um, it's completely the opposite way around. The longest, uh, the, the exons that are unique to the longest CCSs are not under purifying selection. As you can see on the left hand side there, the, the two bars are, are more or less identical. And on the right hand side where you can see the alternative exons, these alternative exons are actually functionally important in these particular, um, in these particular genes. Uh, you can see a couple of examples there of, of the sort of thing that happens in, uh, in the longest CDS transcripts. They quite often have large inserts into the structure. Uh, these are the orange floaty bits that you can see. Um, and um, um, these are quite often uh, primate-derived inserts. Um, in the case of, uh, of the ASMT at the bottom, for example, it, it, uh, the insert uh, comes from a line one transposer. So to sum up, the final result is that um, uh, the most, um, that, um, the most expressed CDS has a poor agreement with the proteomics evidence. The longest CDS exons are not under purifying selection, and we find that the APRI's principal um, isoforms and the main select transcripts are the, are the best methods to use for selecting a, a, a main isoform. Um, so, um, as I said, this is actually what I got ahead of myself there. So, this is actually the, as I said this already. <coughs> okay, so main select and APRI's principal transcripts are the best to predict the main cellular isoforms and exons unique to these two methods are under purifying selection. And um, the two methods together agree more than 98% of the time with the main proteomic size of form. And that's it, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Michael. Time for some questions. Okay, go for it. Hello, really interesting talk. Thank you so much. Um, I had a question about um, the accents, the alternative and the reference accents. Is there an overlap between those two sets? Because you could have that the reference one is just this accent and then the alternative one is this is an uh, accent extension. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I mean, yeah. Um, the, the, the answer is um, they were completely unique. So, so. Um, if you have an ex, uh, uh, imagine for example an exon that is in the reference transcript, and an alternative exon is is a is a, um, an extension of that exon, uh, we we threw those exons out. So we're only looking at exons that did not overlap with any other alternative or principal exons. So there's a relatively limited set because we could have been made the set much larger by including these things, but we only wanted to look at at exons that were totally unique mm. to each of the. Uh, sets of um, that we were investigating. Okay, because I was thinking that you know if, if you were taking those into account, or if you actually took just the extended bit of that uh, alternative X, and those bits possibly would be not like not on the selection at all. Like that that end terminal extension yeah. on, on that example, I bet there's that is so enriching in in variance. Um, the end terminal extension. Oh, right, the the one in in uh, in the vitamin K uh, receptor subunit. Yeah. yeah um, 
Yeah, I, I'm, it's, a, it, it's a strange case, that one, because it's actually full of, of, of glutamates and, and it's a mm. transmembrane protein, so this will be a tail that hangs off the end of it and, it, and it's not really conserved. So I, I, it's curious that it has so many peptides. Yeah. But I, I, it's not, it's actually, as you might have guessed, it's not selected as the main transcript by either main or APRIS in this case. It's just a curious case of actually something that we're seeing quite a lot is the um, internal peptides, ent internal extensions quite often seem to have a certain number of um, peptides. Yeah. Almost like there's, a, there's a, a large amount of leaky scanning going on. Great, thank you. Okay, a question from me then. Okay. So it's anyone else in the audience. So you've got Maine and you've got Priest and they agree 95% of the time, but yeah. is one better than the other or are there scenarios where I might want to use one over the other method? Um, uh, th there are definitely scenarios where, where, where one is better than the other. Um, one where Maine selects uh, differs is that it, it covers the UTR as well. So our Priest basically just works with the CDS. And so what you'll find is that some genes will have two or three um, principal isoforms, but they'll have different UTR. So if you're, if you're needing to work with the UTR, then, then clearly main select is better. Um, in APRIS, there's a much um, larger coverage of modern species. So main select is only available for human, for recent human annotations of RefSec and, and uh, Ensemble. So it's really good for that. And, but if you want to extend a bit further, you've got APRIS will do a job. Great, thank you, Michael. Oh, we have a, go on, go ahead, we've got time. So, my, Michael, thanks, very nice Great. talk, very, very informative. Now, I have a regional question. So, it's, of course, very tempting to think of a, of a reference transcriptome and one transcript per gene, but in reality, it is not a biological thing, and then for the cell, each transcript is somehow unique. Um, it makes sense to think of uh, a reference set of transcripts if you have specific questions to ask, you know, if you want to work out statistics and if you want each transcript to be representative of a gene in some way. But then this brings the question, this will always result into some kind of bias depending on what you want to measure on your transcriptome. And what are, what are, what are, what are the true effective use of such a reference transcriptome and what kind of bias will it induce if it goes one way or the other? Um, you, in the, the thing is that, that an awful lot of uh, experiments and work that you want to do, you're only going to have, uh, you're only going to choose a, a single reference transcript. And so you want to choose the least biased one possible, which is more or less what we're proposing here. Um, if you're missing out, not using um, other isoforms that may be functional, that certainly is the case. Uh, we've found, um, I've got another talk tomorrow about um, functional alternative isoforms. Um, and um, the, uh, uh, we also have a, a method that um, predicts whether protein isoforms are likely to be um, functional or not. And so it's something that we definitely thought, thought about. You can't throw all alternative transcripts away and say these are not important. But there are a lot of alternative transcripts that are more or less non-interesting they're just not they're just not interesting the, the the case we were seeing at asmt for example that had a line one transpose on insertion there's an awful lot of um uh annotated um isoforms that uh, include uh, that are basically um annotated because they've got transposons in them yeah, um, but but they're, so that they're not interesting but the, the functional ones obviously are and so uh, obviously it would be nice to work with um, a function, a, a reference set, a reference set, and on top of that, to also work with a with a set of functional isoforms. If you could actually um, do that, and, and you actually can with APRIS now. On the guessing, the functional ones, yes, definitely. But on picking up one, I have the impression that the idea that one criteria fits everything is a bit unrealistic. That it's going to be really a gene by gene story. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. There's there's genes that have uh, multiple isoforms, but there's an awful lot, awful lot of genes where it only has one important mm -hmm. isoform. And I think um, that there's a lot more genes that only have one important isoform than than genes that have multiple iso important yeah. isoforms. I see. Thank you. Great. So let's thank Michael once again. Now we've got our last talk of this session. 
So it's another highlights paper, and we've got Mihaly Varadi from the EBI, and he's going to talk to us about the AlphaFold database. Thank you very much for the invitation, and thank you for uh, coming to this session. Uh, as you heard, I will talk about the AlphaFold protein uh, structure database, and more importantly, about how you can use these structures and what to look out for uh, if you are trying to use them. So I will start with my main messages. And as this audience knows, you can use many tools from bioinformatics to try to infer the function of proteins from their structures. However, there is a limitation because we don't have too many experimentally determined structures in the protein data bank. We have about 200,000, as you heard from, from Preeti. Now, in this database, we have about uh, 200 million protein, predicted protein structures. And this can help um, tackling quite a few problems. And we do provide uh, access to the confidence metrics as well, in addition to the predicted structures. And if there is just one thing I think you, you take home from all this is maybe the, the, the fourth point, that if you are using these models, it's very important that you use the confidence metrics. And I will explain what these PLDDT and PAE mean. But just remember that you need both confidence metrics if you are using these models. And of course, finally, we also make all the data available uh, through the web pages, but also the public API and the public FTP area of Amber EBI. So first, uh, very briefly about the background of all this. Um, so uh, as you know, and as I mentioned, there are many, many tools you can use to try to understand the function of a protein using a structure. But we don't have too many structures. And in fact, you heard from Pretty there are uh, about 200,000 structures in the PDB that actually correspond to about 60,000 unique proteins. Uh, compare this to the number of uh, sequences in the Uniprot, uh, which is above 200 million, and you can see that merely a fraction of all the known sequences, and this is just Uniprot, so it's, it, it has nothing to do with metagenomics data sets, are covered by uh, experimentally determined structures. And this gap is not uh, decreasing at all. In fact, in the last uh, 10 years, the gap grew by uh, an order of magnitude. This is to do with the um, sequencing getting cheaper and faster, and structure determination is not getting much easier. And so potentially predicted protein structures can help to close this gap if there would be a way to accurately predict structures. And since we released uh, this database last year, we saw that bioinformatics is indeed one of the fields that was most impacted by the access to these, these uh, predicted structures. But it's very important to know how to use them so that you, you don't end up with incorrect uh, conclusions. Now, briefly about AlphaFold2 and uh, how it works, what are the weaknesses, what are its strengths. This is an AI system developed by DeepMind, DeepMind team, one of the teams in DeepMind. And using a protein sequence, it can potentially predict an, a highly accurate theoretical model. In 2022, this uh, was kind of the winner of the CASP 14 competition. And at that time, it was uh, kind of declared that it is a solution to the folding problem. We know it now that it's not. It's not a solution to the folding problem. This AI knows nothing about folding, how this, this happens, actually. It cannot really, uh, it doesn't know anything about the process. What it can do is to predict the fold itself, but it doesn't know the process. So there's still much to do in trying to understand how folding works. However, uh, even with this uh, limitation, it was quite successfully applied to the complete human proteome and, and trying to model that. It obviously has a few strengths. Um, it can predict structures based on amino acid sequences, and quite a few of them are high quality, high, accur high accuracy. If available, it can choose to use templates from PDB, but it can choose not to. And that's actually a smart move because in the PDB, you, we, we do have structures that are not really high quality. Um, and that's something to keep in mind if you are working with the PDB as well. Not, not all of the structures are equal. AlphaFold has three independent outputs, and you should use all three of them. First is this predicted aligned error, and then I will go into the details of what that is. Then this uh, per residue confidence score, which is called PLDDT, and then only then the predicted um, atomic coordinates. It does have a few limitations as well. Um, in this version of AlphaFold, so AlphaFold version 2, it only accepts the 20 standard amino acids in, in the input. It can predict, by, by default, it's predicting five different um, models per prediction run, but they are very similar generally. So if you have a protein and it has distinct conformational states which are relevant biologically, 
it will not pick that up. It will usually just uh, find the, the more uh, frequent or more uh, populated conformation, and that's, that's what you will see. Um, there are some tricks that uh, people are trying to do, like forcing the multiple sequence alignment to be shallow, but it's, it's yet to be seen if that's relevant or not in terms of the conformations we end up with. And it was not uh, trained to do a number of things. So the original version, version two, was not trained to predict assemblies. People tried to use it for it, and it was kind of okay. And then DeepMind team made a new version called AlphaFold Multimer, which is performing quite well. But this, this core AlphaFold version is not trained to do that. It can't predict the effects of mutations. It, um, or it wasn't trained to do it, at least. It uh, was not trained to bind small molecules even though uh, there are other tools or resources like AlphaFill who take AlphaFold models and plug in the ligands. And then, um, so far, it's not working on nucleic acids, so uh, RNA structure prediction, for example, you can't use it for that. In terms of how to use AlphaFold, there are three main ways. One is to take the source code. It's, it's open access. You can just go there and grab it. Um, it's not easy to set this up, but if you, if you know how um, or you invest the time in it, it's the most... Uh, a customizable version, and you have complete control over how you run it. An easier way, perhaps, to do it is to use the Google Colabs, which is kind of like a Jupyter notebook hosted by Google. And it's more limited in terms of what you can do there, but you can uh, plug in your input sequence and, and run it, and you will end up with predictions. And then, perhaps, the option that's most accessible to the broader public is to go to the database and try to see if you already have some pre-calculated um, structures in there. We have, we have for most of the Uniprot, at least currently, uh, we have predictions. Um, however, it's important to know that we, we cannot run new predictions for users. So if you come there, you can't submit a sequence and, and get a structure for that. <clears throat> now, my main, main focus is, of course, the, the database, because I'm mostly involved with, uh, with that. This is a collaboration between DeepMind and Nebula EBI, and all the data are publicly available under CC BY, so quite unrestricted. Uh, license. In terms of what data we have, we have for all these uh, 214 million proteins the predicted atomic coordinates in PDB and MMC format. We have the residue wise confidence measures, which is the SPLDDT score, and we have the predicted aligned error, which I will explain what it means, plus some meta information like identifiers, um, information on species name, gene, biological function. So the first thing is the predicted atomic coordinates. And we store it in two different formats. One is the PDB format, which I guess most people are familiar with who are working with structures. This is the legacy format of the protein data bank. It's actually obsolete. It's not the official format of the protein data bank anymore. Um, but it's very popular. That's what most people are using anyway. And however, we, uh, the PDB archive has the MMC format, which is the, the more um, recent format. And this is the official format of the protein data bank. The reason why it's good, and, and perhaps for this audience it makes sense, is that MMCF is easily extendable and, and much uh, richer data format. You can plug in all kinds of meta information, whereas the PDB format is, is, uh, has its limitations. But in terms of the actual atomic coordinates, it's almost the same in terms of how we uh, record it in this data format. Then the confidence measures, uh, this PIDDT score, it's a local accuracy metric uh, for each, each residue in the prediction. And most often the way you see it is basically using the, the coloring scheme, where if something is blue, dark blue, that's good. That, that means that it has a PRDDT score above 90. And um, so far it seems that that means it has, it's probably as accurate as an experimentally determined residue. So those, those are things you can kind of trust. And then, then uh, there are different levels. The lowest one, uh, so anything above, uh, below 50 PRDDT, that's, uh, that's interesting because um, it often correlates with intrinsic disorder. There are some complexities there, which I'm not going to go into uh, now, but, but generally this means that this might be a flexible region or that the multiple sequence alignment was too shallow. And now finally, yes, this predicted aligned error thing. I think this is probably the most neglected um, output of AlphaFold, but it's very important to actually understand what it does and use it whenever you use the models. This is an independent output, and basically what it does is, say you have two residues, and they are next to each other in the model. This uh, information tells you how reliable is this position between the two residues. So are they really next to each other, or, or, or is it just random? And the way we, so this is a pair by, this is a um, 
you have residue pairs, and we have res uh, scores for this. So we can kind of, it's a ma matrix of values, and we display that as a heat map. So on our pages and, and other pages as well, usually it's a heat map. And the dark green means that those residue pairs, they have confident uh, relative position to each other. So a few examples to explain better. For example, in this case, we have a structure, and you see them, there are two kind of well-defined, probably, domains in this structure. And you might ask, are they really next to each other? And if you, if you look at the PAE plot and, and you see which one is which, so in this case, this part is this, and that part is that. It seems that the whole thing is one big green block. So that means that, yes, they are probably next to each other. You can usually trust that they are next to each other. But on the other hand, say you have this uh, small helix, and it's right next to another small helix, and you might say, oh, maybe I will design a, a small molecule and target this. Maybe it's a nice uh, pocket if you analyze the surface. But if you actually look at the PAE plot, what it tells you is that it's this, this line, uh, or, or this X, more like, the position of this small patch, so the helix, is completely random. It has nothing to do, it's not oriented in any uh, high confidence manner to, to, to all the other parts. So basically, this could be anywhere. This could be here, this could be here. It doesn't tell you, actually, that it is, it is in that uh, position. And that's something that many people uh, neglect when they work with these structures, but it's very important. Because if you don't do this, then obviously you can end up with false conclusions. If you are trying to do small molecule docking, if you are trying to analyze surface properties or, or assess the position and the impact of a known variant, all these are influenced by, by this uh, PAE data because maybe it's not even there where, where you are trying to analyze it. And so in terms of how you can access all these data, so the structures and the confidence metrics, um, this is a brief schematic of how this system works. We, have, uh, we get the data from DeepMind, so the DeepMind engineering team is, is creating all the predictions and the files for us. And then um, we host it at uh, Amble EBI, make, make it available through FTP area. We have a public API, which might be the most relevant to this audience. And we have the web pages as well, where you can uh, inspect all this. So the main entry point for most users is, is the pa web page itself. Uh, you go there, there's a search system. It's not great. It's working, kind of, but we, we label it as beta, because it could be improved, especially the ranking is, is not great. But we are actively working on this. Um, and, well, hopefully you end up with uh, useful search results, and that would lead you to, to one of these pages, which is the, the prediction page. And here you can download um, the coordinates in PDB and NMC format. These two formats both include the PLDDT score as well. So in the case of, of uh, PDB file, it's in the B factor column, and in case of NMC, it has its own category uh, for PLDDT scores. And then we provide the, the predicted aligned error in JSON format as well. We also would like to hear if it's, if it's good or bad. So if you look, look at one of these and say, no, this is horrible, let us know because then we can feed that back to the engineering team and they can look into it, maybe improve the algorithm. We have a, an interactive 3D viewer where we display the PIDDT scores, so basically coloring each residue based on the PIDDT score. And right below that, we have the PAE plot, this, uh, this heat map. And this is interactive. This is communicating with the 3D viewer. So that can help you identify regions which uh, the positioning is, is uh, confident or not. Perhaps more importantly or more relevantly to this, this uh, audience, we have uh, programmatic access. So if you want to access data in Bark, then, then we do have an API. Um, you, you can find the documentation here. It says dev, but it is, it is the actual production API. So don't worry about this. This is the one that we are using internally as well. It should be stable and should be able to handle quite a few um, concurrent requests. You can see a more detailed specification at, uh, at APRE using this link. And yeah, this is well suited for retrieving data in Bark. The response is a JSON object, and it looks kind of like this. It has some quite, quite simple, so basically it has some meta information. It tells you how many uh, versions we have for this particular model. And then these are the, the URLs for various files. We provide the, conf uh, the conformations, well, the coordinates in CIF format, MMCIF. PDB, and also something called binary SIF, um, which you may or may not be familiar with. Basically, it's a binary version of, of the MMC format. And if all you want to do is just to display structures, then binary SIF is great. It's, it's very small. It's like 100 times smaller than, than MMCIF. It's a good way to, to display data. <clears throat> and then we have um, access to the, the heat map, but also the underlying data there. 
<coughs> and finally, we provide access to all the data through the FTP areas of, of Amble BI. And it's important to know there is a readme, and, and it's useful to look at that because it explains all the data that we have and, and what each columns and everything means, so it's quite handy. Um, from here, you can find all the data, but also some additional information, like a list of all the Uniprot accessions that we uh, map to, and, and the exact mapping, so like one to N uh, numbers. Uh, I think it's also mapped to genes, and, and we provide access to all the sequences that we use. So one important limitation is that the PA data is not there yet in the FTP. You can get it from the pages and the API, but it's not in the FTP uh, yet. We are working on that to, to have it there finally. And there are quite a few things we don't yet have in the database. Um, there are no, no we, we don't have multiple conformations. This is to do with this limitation that half of all can't really do it yet. We don't have viral proteins, and this is because the DeepMind team wants to uh, figure out how to consistently deal with polyproteins, but this is coming. So this is kind of a low-hanging fruit that they are looking into now. We don't systematically have isoforms, so usually it's the canonical sequence <coughs> that we have. And we don't have assemblies, which might come later. We don't have any mutant structures, and we don't have ligands in the database. So just to reiterate my main messages, um, bioinformatics has many tools that you can uh, use to infer the, the function of a protein from the structure, but we don't have too many experimentally determined structures. Now, in alpha 4 database, we finally have quite, quite a few of them, and this actually poses its own challenges in terms of processing all this data. However, it's really, really important that you, you use the models together with both confidence metrics before you end up with any kind of conclusions. And all the data you can get from the web pages, the public API, and from the FTP area. And with that, I would like to acknowledge the team who, who worked on this. And yeah, if you have any questions, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Mahali. We're rapidly running out of time, but any questions? Yeah, um, I have uh, one question about something that you probably also don't yet have, but um, I'm over here. Yeah. Oh, right. okay, cool. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, uh, so for the, the predicted alignment error uh, data, it would be great if you could like have a viewer option, like a uh, where you like you you do set it in PAE viewing mode, and you click one residue, and then the rest of the structure is colored by the whatever row or column yes. in the matrix, so you can immediately see which parts are aligned or like you can you can trust to be or, yes. uh, oriented towards that that part of the structure. Yes. Is that something you're planning to include? Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes, yeah, yes, okay. yes, yes. We are working on that. Thanks. Great talk. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, go. Yeah, it's about the potential capability of alpha fold of describing different conformation of uh, one single protein. And my point there is that simply we do not have the experimental information for, for training anything like that at this moment. I mean, we have the molecular dynamics up to some scale. The NMR will have flexibility in some manner. Uh, cryo -EM is starting now with the continuous flexibility. So, yeah, yeah, it's that, for that's, the future. A, that's a very good point. So we, we, we do have some projects in, in the PDB team looking into the conformations, distinct conformations uh, across the PDB archive and trying to, to see if, if there is a big enough training data set kind of. But yeah, it's not, a, not an easy problem at all. So yeah, I don't, yeah. Okay, I think we're very much out of time. So um, if you do have a question, Mahali, you can sure you can meet Mahali in a coffee or post a session. Um, so that's the end of the second protein session. Um, we've got two more tomorrow, so do come along to those. And thanks to all the speakers in this session.